The following program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org. His Chicago roots propelled him to success on the small and big screens. Acting became his tool. The Five Heartbeats, Love and Basketball, The Matrix, Ray, and The Blacklist, his platform. His name, Harry Lennox, and The History Makers, the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive, is proud to present a musical evening with Harry Lennox. Good evening, Chicago. I am the youngest son of Lillian Cleo Vines and Harry Joseph Lennox, Jr. My mother was born in Palmyra, North Carolina, and my father was born in Laplace, Louisiana. His father had been an amateur jazz trombonist who was descended from a line of the Lenny Lenape Delaware Indians who moved down to New Orleans and mixed with the Creoles and the African slave on the sugarcane plantations. Those plantations were the site of the largest and most violent slave rebellions in United States history. My mother and father met here in Chicago. She was working for Spiegel, and my father was a machinist. They both loved music, and they loved to sing. It was rumored that my father sounded a little like Billy Eckstein. But their lives here weren't always easy. In fact, my father died before I was two years old. And even when I was born, they weren't quite sure that I would make it, my parents. I was born premature and was put in an incubator. My mother wouldn't see me. But my father, you know, I believe he made a pact. He said, God, if you save this kid, you can take me instead. He died at the age of 41, leaving my mother to raise us. My skin is black. My skin is black. My arms are long. My arms are long. My hair is woolly. My hair is woolly. My, My back, back is strong. My back is strong, strong enough to take the pain inflicted again and again. What do they call me? My name is Aunt Sarah. My name is Aunt Sarah. My hair 
is fine My hips invite you My lips, they're like wine Who's a little girl am I? Anyone who has the money to buy What do they call me? My name is Sweet Thing. My name is Sweet Thing. Oh, 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 sweet Thing. Mr. James Perkins. is brown My manner is tough I will kill the person whether I see Because my life has been rough I am awfully bitter these days Because my Let's go back to your earliest memories as, as a child. Where did you live there in Chicago? I lived um, two places. I just, I don't remember the exact address, but I remember one place was on Peoria. And then uh, we moved to the place where I grew up, which is on Phillips in Chicago, Phillips Avenue in South Shore. And um, I remember my very first memory is being down in Virginia with that mule. And I remember, uh, like I said, the dull eyes of a mule that scared me. I don't know why. I didn't think that something should be able to be that strong and that stupid mm -hmm. and be able to move like that. Um, that people were dependent on it to get from one place to the other. And it, it, it seemed to me an enormously unpredictable beast, mm -hmm. and that uh, it didn't seem as if it were something with which one could reason, uh, nor did it seem reasonable that people like my cousins, who were not very old, must have been nine or ten, were sitting on tree branches spitting tobacco juice. I remember thinking, why would they? <laughs> but that's not civilized. I just remember thinking that the whole thing was completely uncivilized, mm -hmm. and that. that uh, that um, it smelled of mud and of rain and of uh, grass and of things that, chickens and things that didn't belong in anybody's home. That's, uh, that's These my- These were foreign odors to you. They were, um, and not particularly pleasant, not particularly unpleasant, but just something that didn't seem that they didn't belong in the day-to-day -day lives of people. Memories are powerful things. They can hold on to you, sometimes haunting you, 
Sometimes making you laugh. Harry, do you remember Karen Mason? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was four years old, and she would grab my hand and walk me to school. Do you remember when your brothers would beat up on you to toughen you? Yeah. What was that about? They were like fathers to you. Larry taught you about music. Michael was your protector. Do you remember going to the movies and sitting there eating popcorn? Those were my favorite days. Gave me my love for the movies. And of course, there was my magnificent sister, Lori. She later became a teacher and a school principal. What about the 13-inch black and white TV that you and your family would watch TV on? Ah, uh, yeah. Nova, Masterpiece Theater, Sesame Street, the wide world of sports. Those were my shows. Really? Man, I liked cartoons instead. What about that time when you were peeping through the keyhole? and saw your uncle kissing a woman. Ooh, wee! <laughs> yeah, and I remember the block parties. That was so much fun. Although I remember somebody calling me a white boy. Hey, you white boy. Hey, white boy, yo mama. Yeah, well, yo mama back at you. on the Vietnam, give me second class housing and second class schools. To earn a little cash Oh, you leave me with this old back The world is big Big, bright and round For the folks like me That are red, yellow, black and brown There's no back
There came a time when you uh, decided you would, did not want to be the Pope uh, if you had to be a priest. Uh, tell us about that. Her name was Anita Blanchard. <laughs> and I met her uh, when I was about 13. Uh, and I, I thought that she was the most exquisite thing in the world. And uh, I decided at that point that I was going to marry her. <laughs> and uh, I met her briefly, and then I met her briefly again when I was about 15. And boy, I mean, if, it could, if you could get even more in love, I was just head over heels. I just, I read every romantic novel that I could find, watched every movie, was, watched things like Rebecca. And, and, and Anita Olivia. was in all of them. <laughs> yeah, right? she was all of it, you know. The Great Gatsby, she was Daisy Buchanan, you know, she was everything. She had the catcher in her eyes. She was Sally and Jane both. I mean, she was everything to me. And, uh, and she was going to become a doctor. And she is a doctor. Oh, okay. And, uh, and she's got four wonderful children and a wonderful husband. And, you know, there was never anything except for my abiding love for her. But she treats me now like I'm her fifth child. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, she, she makes sure I have enough to eat. There's a place to stay. She's, she's just great. I just adore her. But uh, I left the seminary to go to Northwestern so that I could be with her. Uh, we never even dated Never even kissed her, uh, but I just was nuts about it, and I uh, I don't regret one minute of it. She was the purest, most beautiful love of my entire life, even if it wasn't reciprocated. She was just she was just great. So she almost single-handedly uh, um, spared the world my papal uh, edicts. <laughs> <laughs>
All of my teachers. I remember Miss LaPlante, uh, Miss Baricolo when I was in kindergarten. I had a good friend. Uh, my best friend there was white. Yeah, I remember the teachers were all white and uh, until there was a guy by the name of Mr. De Jesus, who was a black man who was like a fourth grade teacher. And I remember wanting to get into his class, but it didn't work out that way, but I was very fond of my teachers. They were all nuns, and uh, I think they were of the IBVM order, Inter uh, Immaculate Blessed Virgin Mary order, and um, were strict, wore habits, most of them, and um, were good educators, uh, were diligent about uh, us learning civics and American history. I remember once, uh, was it cheating? Sort of cheating. I was taking my test up and I was asking my friend what his answer to number seven was and the teacher caught us both and we both got F, so I remember that. And so that, that was a signal in the, uh, event in my life, thinking, you know, you have to be rigorously honest. But at what point did Mr. Lennox start to find his way? When I was young, I wanted to be a world explorer, then a teacher. Now, I think I want to be an artist. But my parents want me to be a lawyer. I'm a junior in high school, and my parents did not go to college. My guidance counselor said that I should start at community college, but my mother got mad at the thought. I really do not know what I want, but I know that I love to draw. And recently, I won a contest at my school. My parents are worried about the cost. How will they afford it, and how can I make a living? But my mentor told me just don't give up hope that my future is right in front of me. There also uh, came a period, um, and you uh, have not reached Northwestern, I don't believe, uh, where you started to take an interest in being on the stage. Tell us about that. Well, actually, when I was in elementary school, we, we, uh, we would do a sort of a spring you know, musical. They were usually you know, silly little trifling things that, uh, that uh, told a story about something like American inventors or the American journey from the West to you know, opening up the West Coast and all that stuff. And I did one of them, I must have been in sixth grade. I remember that these kids came up from a, another school and we had occasion to talk afterward and somebody gave me what I thought was an enormously flattering compliment. They said that I reminded them of Clifton Davis and I loved Clifton Davis. I used to watch That's My Mama and all that stuff. Sophomore year, uh, some friends of mine were auditioning for the play. And, uh, and I saw a bunch of girls uh, <laughs> that were auditioning for the play too. And I auditioned. And I got a small part in it. It was uh, Guys and Dolls. I saw Guys and Dolls, the movie. Mm -hmm. And I remember at that same time I had read a book by Mario Puzo called uh, The Godfather. The fact that that was the same guy from The Godfather that was in this Guys and Dolls thing. Mm -hmm. Not Sinatra, but Marlon Brando, and, and, and I became fascinated with Brando. And um, I just started watching everything that I could. I would get the, the uh, movie, the TV guide every week. This was before, you know, VCRs and all that stuff. Um, and I would find Brando movies, and then I would read about them from books in the library. I would you know, find out about the people he liked, and I would watch those movies. I would watch Olivier and Alec Guinness and, 
And then from Guinness, I would watch people like Charlie Lawton. And from Lawton, I would watch people like Robert Donat and Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton. You know, like there were all these tangential lines, these connecting threads of amazing performers. And then, you know, I, we were reading in high school, A Raisin in the Sun. And I saw this guy, this Sidney Poitier guy. And I thought that he was amazing, just amazing. And Paul Newman and Ivan Dixon and, and you know, there were these amazing actors, wonderful actors. Yeah, actors were opening up the world for me, the theater and movies and, and books. Must have been cold day in Machiato. To never have sunlight on your face. You were content to let me shine. That's your way. You always walked a step behind. I finally gave up on that dream of finishing the seminary and becoming the Pope. <laughs> Instead, I went on to Northwestern University, and so did my friend Anita. The world opened up for us. We were young and enthusiastic. It was a brand new world with students from completely different economic backgrounds. People who had cars and second homes and summer vacations. <laughs> I had grown up uh, watching people struggling to make the rent with uh, Hustlers and street gangs and the neighborhood wino. And for me, it was quite an effort to get all the way down from the south side up to Northwestern University, to Evanston, 
on public transportation? Harry, I want to be a doctor. What do you want to do? I do not like geology. And while I did like nuclear physics, nuclear physics didn't like me. But I did like literature. And I had a knack for Latin and other Romance languages. It was a time of Mayor Harold Washington and the anti-apartheid movement. It was a time of change. And the theater took hold of me. play. I did a Raisin in the Sun, and uh, I played Bobo, and uh, the smallest part in the play, <laughs> really. And, um, but it was fascinating, and I remember watching other actors. I would go to sit in on other acting classes, and we had some brilliant actors there. Mm -hmm. A guy by the name of Steve Marvel, and a guy by the name of Dennis O'Hare, and Tom Swift, Mandy Daniloff, uh, Doug Grad. Um, Patty Acha, I mean, these were tremendous talents, uh, uh, really. And I would go and sit in on their classes and watch them perform Pinter and Shakespeare and things like that, mm -hmm. and, um, and see their performances. I learned a lot, reluctantly, mm -hmm. because I should have had bigger roles in them. But that was sort of my first taste of the difficulties of being a black actor in a white environment mm -hmm. and not being able to do the roles that I was capable of and deserved and had earned, <clears throat> partly because of seniority, but also partly just because of the fact that right. people's brains weren't open in that way at that time in that environment. University theater was like, you know, the, the, the bigger theaters on campus. And I was doing a play with a white South African, The Island, by Athel Fugard. And we took the better part of an afternoon and got to know each other a little bit and wound up doing this play, The Island, which was an instant hit, and um, which you couldn't get a ticket for. Like, it was, it was mad. How long did that run on campus? Uh, two or three weekends, two weekends. Okay. But like, we had to add a show or something. It was crazy. Like, uh, people were literally hanging from the rafters to see this thing. And uh, I'd also done a play with my friend, uh, David Schwimmer, called Private Wars. Who became famous on, on the uh, television show Friends. I stayed largely away from university theater. I did uh, a big thing. This may have been at the end of my sophomore year. I'm not sure. Maybe not. But I did Huckleberry Finn. I think that was my junior year. And it was a big university theater production directed by Frank Galati. And I played, you know, Nigger Jim. Mm -hmm. and, uh, or Big Jim, sometimes referred to as. It was a hit, you know? like. I was in these hits. Mm -hmm. And so an agent came down from this place called Getty's and she signed me. And so I started going out on professional auditions and my uh, horizon started to open up.
back at that young man. I have tremendous affection for him. He, he had moxie. He had guts. And these kids tonight, they have moxie. They have guts. And they have a dream. It's up to us to inspire that dream, to invest in it, to support and guide them. And if we do, their dreams can also come true. Nothing but love for you, baby. 
Ray? You can step outside, Joe. I'll be in my office. I hate to be so pedantic, Lieutenant, but I believe it isn't that something. That this gold must coin a stratagem, which, cunningly affected, will beget a very excellent piece of villainy. But you asked for one ship to remain behind. I would have stayed, but I needed to recharge my ship. So you admit to a direct contravention of your duty. Can you tell us what's going on? Nothing. I have no history with Reddington. They tell me today's your first day as a profiler. Are you telling me that 75 black and brown women took the United States military armory unarmed? All right. You've got our attention. What is it you want? I would like to speak to Lois Lane. What makes you think she's here? Don't play games with me, General. And when the bank forecloses, I'm going to buy your shop and turn it into a more viable cash cow, like a Bally's or Jamba Juice. So I, I produced a film called Mr. Sophistication, and uh, there's a song in it called uh, There For You. And that's what uh, you all have been tonight. You've been there for me all my career. I took a trip on a train, saw things don't ever change. But in my world, it don't mean a thing. That's why I'm there for you. 
I climbed on a mountain top. Yeah. Saw this great big world don't stop. But if you need me, everything will drop. Because yeah. I care for you. That's why I'm there for you. You can post me a letter, send me a sign. You can call on me just any time. I'll get there in a hurry. You get here as you can. Right now is the moment. Right here is where I stand. I sailed across the sea. Met a king and queen for tea. In my mind, they're temporary things yeah. compared to you. Compared to you. And truth or dare for you. Truth or dare. This is a little song you might know. It goes, uh, it's my living in vain, and it starts like a little bit like this. I'm gonna get this. It's my living in vain. Oh. It's my giving in vain. It's my praying in vain. Would you please tell this audience what the only true, real blues song is that's in your heart? It's rhetorical, my dear. Because uh -oh. it's my sweet home. Uh -oh. And the song is there for Sweet Home Chicago. I got the four. <laughs> okay, we're going to get y'all together. Come on.
information or to order your own copy of A Musical Evening with Harry Lennox, please visit thehistorymakers.org or call 866-914-1900. That's 866-914-1900. The preceding program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org.